enthusiasm. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's much better. Okay. So today um, um, is the last day of our training under Quest for Quality Excellence, and the topic that we're covering today is continued process verification. Just a show of hands. Who's attended any training program under Quest before today? How many of you attended investigation or good documentation practices? Okay, so a few people. Yes, a uh, few people have attended. Okay, so um, before we start, all right, just to introduce ourselves, we have a new facilitator. So it's good for uh, everybody also to introduce themselves. I think Casper will also get a sense of who all is here. So we'll do a little round of introduction. Uh, it will be helpful if all of you can just state your name, right, and um, one sentence, right. So what you need to tell us is what motivates you, right. One, your name and what motivates you in life. So I'll start. My name is Swati Mittal. Uh, I'm from McKinsey and what motivates me is the thought of a great future. My name is G. Suman Kumar. motivates me to run the entire day. I'm Sai Krishna. Opportunities in the future gives me good motivation. Good morning. My name is Prashant. Um, my opportunity is to learn in school. Good morning. My name is Hari Krishna. Uh, my opportunity is uh, to, to boost up my career. Good morning. My name is Sunil Kumar. Let us go. My name is Trisha. My family motivates me to go for it. My name is Suresh. And, and my motivation is to train the people. As a channel, my motivation will make me good people. My name is Chaudhary. Nature motivates. Nature motivates. My name is Tendra Babu. My motivation is good nature and society. My name is Vandish Shoram. My motivation is to lead good future. My name is Shivas Krishna. My motivation is a better future. My name is Narendra Babu. Good future. This is Patisha. This is Pratyusha. My motivation is improve skills and uh, be a part of success. My name is Bangeshri. My motivation is I need to improve my career and future. Yeah, I am Pragya. My motivation is to be in the best position in future. Hi, this is Karyani. And my opportunity is to improve my skills. I am Pravin. My motivation is day to day learning. Hi, I am Kiran. My motivation is to have a good future. Hi, this is Will. My motivation is to excel in my career. My name is Vai Kiran. My motivation is learning to be a My name is Kiran Kumar. My motivation is good culture. My name is Suresh. My motivation is to provide the quality medicine to person. My name is Vamsi Krishna. My motivation is being a good human being. My name is Naveen Kumar. New thoughts in current trends is the motivation. My name is Sadish Kumar. My motivation is having a good future. <coughs> My name is Anu Madhu. My motivation is everyday learning. My name is Tarun. Uh, my motivation is to improve my skills. My name is Krishna Chaitanya. My motivation is to excel in my career. Hi, this is KV Ketreti, and my motivation is my family to work hard and care. My name is Kishore. <coughs> my motivation is to reach the good position in my job. This is Adhiman Ketreti. My motivation is my family. This is Kodeshwar. My motivation is the Sharing good thoughts. 
My name is Venkatesh. My motivation is uh, learning uh, and uh, transference to other each uh, colleagues and other persons. Hi, my name is Vijay. My motivation is bright future. Uh, hi, uh, myself Girish. Uh, positive people surround me and positive work environment motivates me. My name is Srinivas. My motivation is reaching up to goals. Myself, Suresh. Uh, my motivation is uh, my goals and uh, continuous learning. <coughs> my self is Nagaraja. My goal is uh, being a human being. My name is Srinivas. My motivation is learning. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pavan Bhatt. I'm guessing the question about some motivation to be able to learn something and keep up with the current trends. I'm Lingara. Challenges motivates me. Hi, I'm Prateek from the McKinsey team. And what motivates me is to be better every day. Hi, I'm Chitrikhet. I'm also from the McKinsey team. I think working on interesting problems and working with great people motivates me. My name is Caspar. My motivation is a challenge and adventure. My name is Narendra Kumar. <laughs> keep on, uh, uh, try, keep on, uh, continue your uh, this one efforts. So results will come automatically. Farooq. So myself, Farooq. Day-to-day uh, -day learning is motivating. Okay, so uh, like we all know, we are here to learn about continued process verification here as part of quest for capability building. Um, I'd let Casper, our facilitator for today, introduce himself. As you can read, my name is Casper. Maybe you all, everybody knows my comic twin, which is Casper Friendly Ghost. I'm friendly, but I'm certainly not a ghost. <laughs> so I'm really energized, enthusiastic to be here. It's my first time to be in India. It's not my first time to work with Indian colleagues, though. So as you can read, uh, more or less 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry. It started off with during my university career in 97. Then. Uh, from an employment perspective, I started my career in QC, moved on to technical development, scale up, auditing. Then I did a number of roles in production, including actually building a facility. And then I was wanting to encounter more adventure and challenge. That's when I joined McKinsey. I stepped back from the firm for the last couple of years to better balance family and career. And I'm looking forward to rejoining McKinsey next year. So I would say sort of a, a peer to you, to you guys. And uh, so I'm looking forward to a really full day of uh, CPV training. Great. Thank you, Cass. But before we just start, uh, maybe I'd like Dr. Bhatt to come and say a few words just to inspire these people to learn CPV. It would be good to hear from you. Good morning. I think uh, this is the third workshop as a part of the initiative taken by NADCO's uh, senior management uh, in terms of providing continuous training for the people. So I guess uh, as part of that theme, uh, continuous process validation I think is uh, you know something critical that um, you know QA probably monitors as a part of the annual uh, product review and submissions, but it's important that everybody understands that like product development, um, you know, there is always uh, opportunity to improve something that we do, but uh, there is the challenge of maybe the speed, the timing and other things that forces us to move forward in terms of uh, the journey of the product, right? So 
I think the expectation from many of the regulatory bodies is that you understand the process, you keep working on the process until you get to a point where you have a very good handle on your critical process variables, your critical quality attributes and ultimately, you know, whatever is uh, uh, from a manufacturing perspective yields a product which is consistent day in and day out, right? And as a manufacturing company, we have a very good idea about any changes and the impact of those changes on the product. I think it is, unless we are able to uh, get a handle on that, uh, this continuous process validation, I think, is an important part that will continue for every product. And uh, since we, in the industry, we are also uh, going through changes such as uh, facility changes, expansions, movement of product from one block to the other, from one side to the other. It gives us a better handle on the product in terms of transfer from one site or one block if you have a good handle on the continuous process validation as part of our ongoing program. So I think, um, as I mentioned earlier in one of the sessions, let's make it interactive. So it is, uh, don't, don't be hesitant to ask any questions. So uh, try to gain the best out of the experts that are there over here. And, um, you know, hope it is fun. I think at the end of the entire program that is there put together as, as part of the quest, I'm quite confident that everybody goes, who goes to the program, the different modules, is going to have a better perspective on what we do and a better handle on how to approach things. So, thanks and welcome. And it's sort of three pillars or three columns, which is on an individual basis, we need some learning to advance for some or for everybody of our family and the social environment is important. And of course, society and culture. So this is great energy, and let's see how this transfers into our responsibility on how to continue to produce high quality medicines. So from the agenda perspective, we do the introduction round on CPV, continuous process verification, and let's really make this session interactive. I do realize from my background that I do have a strong Swiss accent, which might be not so familiar to some of you, so if there's any kind of things you don't understand, terms I use, just feel free to interrupt me to say, hey, there's a question, and whenever things are presented, you would like to ask questions, it's best to discuss it and to have a conversation on the spot. So please feel more than invited to say, hey, Caspar, can we hold on and focus on this point? So let's move on with this. Uh, so, we should focus on the expectations today. So maybe we can have some comments on what you expect today. Somebody volunteering, what's the expectation? What we want to get out of today? Should I just, what's your expectation? Maybe if I... <laughs> yeah, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, with the current trends of process capability, whatever we have established already, with the challenges prevailing for deviations and the out-of-specification test results, how our regulators would be expecting in the firm like to be in the continuous uh, process verification scenario, how we can apply if any such deviations and out-of-specification uh, test results arise, even uh, 
verification of kappa becomes challenging. So how this all fits in? Yeah, how can fit in in this continuous process verification? How can statistical metrics that you calculate be used for continued process verification? Thank you. Maybe taking somebody here. Volunteering, what's your expectation for today? <laughs> And my expectation is that how we can interrupt this, I mean, the process where continuous process verification seems to the problem to avoid the process validations and, I mean, in our regular manufacturing activities, if it is already established bread and due to the small changes in the equipments, we are going all again the validations, again, like process validations. So how we can interrupt this uh, in interpretations of uh, process where, I mean, Continuous process with the validations, regular validations. Okay, so interface verification validation yes. changes. Good. Anybody else? Anybody else? Maybe two persons on the back. <laughs> so, uh, interpretation between uh, process validation and uh, continued uh, process verification. Uh, if we completed uh, process validation, so then uh, uh, in uh, continuous batches production, if anything happens and uh, if we are uh, going beyond the process validation uh, uh, established parameters, then uh, what needs to be done? So maybe somebody at the back. And so our uh, regulatory says that uh, must determine the batches for continuous process verification. So how many batches we can determine? What is the expectations of the batches? Either it may be 100 or it may be 200 or 300. <laughs> so what is the perfect uh, number of uh, batches to be continued? To be continued, okay. Excellent question. Now you see the process itself is stronger and it's less dependent on skilled, capable, smart individuals. And that's the overarching concept on why we apply concepts like qualification, like validation and continuous process verification. And it all serves to deliver high quality medicine. In actual feedback and expectations. I feel like we cover most of them and I offer to go back to wrap up session to see whether we have all covered these expectations and lived up to them and also try to check during breaks whether we meet those expectations. So we can just quickly talk about this chart <coughs> What uh, Casper is saying, right? We have a process no. and we have people working on that process, right? To create a high quality business. So this arrow indicates 
a process and these are the people right say peter raj uh, uh, raju and creating a high quality medicine the purpose of continuous process verification is actually to make this process stronger and less dependent on the people who are working on it right? so this thin arrow can become this broader arrow right where the process is so strong that it is less people dependent and is robust in itself and can deliver high quality medicine that's the purpose of continued process verification thank you and also it, it helps to question what happens if people moves on in his career it's working better now it's now just so use this <laughs> yes it's better so it, it also helps us to solve the question what happens if Raj moves on in his career and somebody else moves in with which is not as capable to start with. So in this case, the process becomes much weaker. The process itself is strong, it really helps us. So, <laughs> so now we are going to watch the video. And the question is on how many times the black team passes the ball. And really try to concentrate on how many times, how many successful passes they will have. The white team is trying to intercept the ball. Right? Let's start. One, two, three, go. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. Everybody come, come through. But the did you see the moonwalking bear? First question mark. Go! Did everybody see the bear now? Exercise, it's, it's really to, to demonstrate if you focus on something like the passes, you miss something else which is quite important. When I saw this movie the first time and I got the question, did you see the beer? What beer? What a strange question. So I think a lot of people in this audience also feel the same when you get the question, mm, beer? <laughs> What's all about it? And we're going to learn how continuous process verification helps us to focus beyond on what you're, on what's the daily jobs, beyond average, uh, everyday batch release, to, to help identify what, what else is important out there. The question, did everyone see the dancing bear? Shall I move back? Did everyone see? So the question was how many passes does a white team make, right? And I think people were counting whether it was 11, 12, 13. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? It's really like in everyday life at the facility. There's qualification, there's a staff turnover, maybe somebody being on sick leave or absent, somebody else needs to cover up. Uh, some issues happening in production, you're focusing on that, but are you focusing on what's truly important, although you, you do the best you can, and there's always the chance that you miss important stuff. <coughs> Just let me make sure I'm in. 
on our flows to make this interactive. So in stage one, to recap, when process design, what would you typically do? You would start off with a target product profile, right? It would maybe be a, a tablet, should be immediate release. The solution should be at least 70% in 30 minutes. That's a typical target product profile. And then you think about, okay, how do I achieve this? What's, what's important? So you derive critical to quality parameters. And then in process design, you think about, okay, what critical process parameters do have an influence? and what critical material attributes do have an influence. Critical material attributes might be the magnesium steroid surface. There's a great difference whether you use Peter Breven or Malincroft magnesium steroid. It has an impact on the mixing time, on the lubrification mixing time. So that might be a very practical example on how you think about and how you design your process. Once you design the process, you move on to stage two, process qualification, PPQ. So there you then make sure the process works and it's fit for purpose, right? And then, so just let me go back, check here. So we typically do it with three batches, right? Who in this room has done a process uh, PPQ with less than three batches? With more than three batches? Three batches? Who has done three batches? Well, everybody does three batches, right? <laughs> so, when we now flip over, So the guidance would ask for a plan to execute system monitoring and, it's, and it ensure that the state of control after those three PPQ matches is maintained. So typically you would do something like you would do your development You would then do PPQ. There might be a change that would trigger revalidation. You would also do your annual product quality report, right? That's sort of very traditional. And now we're talking about the third, which is continuing process verification. And that's really sort of fitting in the gap a yearly product quality review where you collect the producer's risk of one full year and to sort of slot it down to bits and pieces. So in this process, if something happens, you might hatch it end of the year or after 12 months when you do the annual product quality report. And this is really trying to make you aware of things that happen that might be a big producer's risk after each batch. Space and uh, QBD type of work done up front. 
but instead of that, there is this expectation of because you have control over the product or you have one, your design space has defined everything in terms of risk assessment, but you know you keep monitoring and ensuring that whatever you did earlier on a larger scale or you know different people is still meeting that expectation. Absolutely correct. So. Maybe let me respond to these questions with how you set specifications. You do your development and you have limited experience on your product. You have a couple of larger scale batches and then you ask the tough questions. Hey, what specification should I set? What's the basis? Uh, so you do the best you can. You take all your data and you set your specs. Um, they are set on a limited if at all, they're set on a limited amount of statistical data. And for, this is mostly for process parameters. Of course, the regulator has clear expectations on the specs when it comes to SA. So a tablet is meant to have 95 to 105% of the, of the label claim. Other than that, you, you do not have much experience. Through PPQ, you demonstrate, okay, it seems to be fit to meet those specifications, but then really to, to use all the data you have and to make sure that you always meet those specifications, that's where continuous process verification helps you a great deal. And uh, in a later session, we're also focusing on sort of some statistical tools you may apply to help you. Did this sort of answer the question? And I, and you know, I think it is important to understand how the mindset of regulated bodies is moved or you know certainly the burden on R&D and in going into a approval process, product development and approval process has moved from a, a you know tradition you know, I would say limited set of experiments but uh, supported by you know in in the US before 2014 it was one batch so you hardly had any information and so the inf emphasis was very much on process validation for everything we did every change we did you have to validate now you know as the expectations has evolved it is in your development there is uh, the challenges that you have to do at extremes you have to define your design space, you have to do risk assessment based on what we have done. And the idea is that you know your product much better going into, and of course there are the three batches expectation. You know that in going into commercial production, the idea of your product in terms of what affects it is much better understood today than it used to be about, you know, let's say eight, ten years back. And so they the traditional emphasis on process, you know, one-time process validation is still there, but it is less to because now it is any change. Actually, the regulators have in fact come out and said that there are many changes depending on your risk assessment. When you determine it to be low risk, there should be nothing done, nothing expected because you have defined the risky space, if you will, for the product. And if it doesn't fall into that risk area, then the expectation is that you don't have to repeat validation. I think it's very important. I know that there are many people from QA and other departments that we understand this expectation. Because if if you're if we are doing a lot of work up front in terms of development and we say that these parameters are not critical, but we still go back and say that we made a minor change so we have to revalidate the process then it defeats the purpose and becomes more cumbersome, let's say, on our side. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Correct, yes. While you were speaking, I was drawing this little chart. But basically, in development, you try to find out what's the working range of my process. When do I fail? So in a, for a tablet, you would do uh, compression force hardness dissolution profile, you would find out, okay, if I compress with 8 kilonewtons, I will fail this integration, I will fail the solution, the tablet hardness is way, 
tell this way too hard. On the other hand, there might be a lower edge of the process. You need at least some hardness that the tablet is stable, that you can package it into blisters or bottles, that it can be delivered to the patient. You would then transfer and narrow this down to sort of what's safe to operate, and then you would decide on what should I validate, and then you would make sure that you stay within that validation range, and um, maybe you come to the conclusion in this example that, okay, compression force that's monitored very tightly, and um, it's adequately controlled. However, you might decide, I would like to monitor what's critical to quality, which might be dissolution. And then you would focus on monitoring dissolution and checking whether my dissolution is in control, whether I always achieve the target. And that's what it, where it sort of merges and fits in. And then you would find out, oh, I do have a dissolution failure. And then it kicks in with the deviation process. You would raise the deviation. You would follow up and maybe find out, oh, there's something else beyond hardness and compression force that has affected. Maybe there was a change in raw materials, which we were not aware of. Or maybe the manufacturer did something. And it, it helps you to focus on what's truly important to achieve the critical to quality. And you catch it early. You don't catch it when it goes off track. So it also helps you to then reduce the producer's risks. So you don't have a lot of batches on the critical path which might not be released. Maybe you have one or two. So, and of course, what FDA criticizes a lot. Traditionally, industry was very strong on this part. That's bread and butter, everybody knows. However, continuous process verification, the industry is moving slowly, and that's why you find some uh, 483s out there where they focus exactly industry being weak on this third step. Actually, the company I'm currently working for, we also, just like everybody else, <laughs> We had a visa inspection, and we also got cited for products that our statistical process analysis in the annual product quality report was not strong enough. So we actually need to enforce on how do we come from CPME, how do we link this into this battle. So in our case, this was too much separated, and we need to make sure that we sort of cross this bridge. So the framework for CPV is basically the first step. We design the program, the plan. Proper planning prevents poor performance. That's very true in life. However, having said that, I know that whenever I see a plan, it's a little bit wrong. It's the, it's the, it's the effort to try to predict the future. Nobody can predict the future, but you must really try hard to do a very good job and design an adequate program. Then you establish the infrastructure and you decide on how you're collecting the data, who is doing what, it can become very tactical, who is retrieving the data out of a batch record, how is it transferred into a validated Excel sheet, how is it calculated properly. Then there's a a phase called data analysis and review. So how do we, what do we do with this data? How are we, what calculations are we doing and how do we interpret the data? And then it comes, here you did, you really tried hard to predict the future to a good plan. However, you might find out, oh, there's a, there's a gap I need to improve. And uh, this improvement will also then strengthening process understanding, and you might change your plan or adapt your plan. In the CPV plan, you should always reassess the plan. And then maybe you find out after one year that, okay, um, my 
my mixing parameters they're adequately controlled. Uh, so one one example in your process in your annual product quality report. Uh, so a graph like this. We actually said this is the mixing time. Was it 10 minutes for about 30, 30 batches? So, what does this graph tell us? It shows okay from your process setup in manufacturing, it's really adequately controlled. And then, uh, when you look at what's the effect of the mixing time, what does it have an impact? It might have an impact on content uniformity, right? It might have an impact on the solution. Then you also check this data, and then you might come to the conclusion, say, okay, this is adequately controlled, and I can focus less on control. I do not have to focus on this control as tightly anymore. I can release the effort there, because I have all this data and experience. And that's why it goes both ways. When we focus here on what could the change be on the plan. It could be a change where you need to focus more, or it could give you some indication where you can start to focus. Is that more? Do you have a really challenge the mixing time because all the benefits are not really saying it's That's the APQR example. Hopefully you have challenged this in validation. During developer development. Correct. So say, having said that, I would, I would assume that in validation you covered the minimum and you covered the maximum and you showed successful rate and during one year you showed, okay, we are perfectly capable of controlling this parameter and keep it exactly where we want it. So this gives you a strong indication, say, okay, I will not include mixing time in my CPD plan anymore for the coming year when you rerun the plan. Does it make sense for you? and CTV linked, right? Why do we need to do both? I think what you need to understand is that process validation is a three-step process. First is when you design your overall process, right? You set your uh, target profile, your critical process parameters, your critical quality attributes, right? Then you do your process qualification, right? You do three batches, you manufacture three batches, check whether your process is qualified, can you, uh, can you meet uh, Statistical sufficient, statistical confidence, right, of quality within your, uh, between your batches. And the third part, right, is continued process verification. Once you've designed your process, once you've qualified your process, actually ongoing, monitoring your data, collecting and analyzing data and monitoring your data to determine whether your process remains in statistical control or not, on a continuous basis. And not just at the end of the year, right, on a, on a batch to batch basis, each batch you're monitoring, you're collecting data, you're checking if your batch continues to be, if your product continues to be in a state of control. Clear? And obviously, this is something which FDA is now looking at very closely, right? They don't want you to only check at the time you developed your product, at the time you qualified your product, or only at the end of each year. How do you maintain confidence that during the year, 
as you manufacture each batch you continue to be in a state of control and hence cpv has become extremely important and there are companies which are receiving 483 observations and not having cpv in fact what casper mentioned right the company which he currently works for they recently had an inspection and they got cited for this that you are not monitoring your batches on a continuous basis the overall framework right how how we think about continued process verification the first step is actually designing your cpv program right uh, at what frequency will you monitor what will you monitor how will you monitor right then actually developing or establishing the infrastructure to collect that data very tactical right uh, data kaha se aayega batch records se aayega qc lab se aayega who will collect that data whose responsibility is it to collect that data where will you actually feed in that data do you have validated excels uh, so for example uh, raj will take the data on yield from the batch record feed it into this excel and maintain the data right just deciding who will collect how will they collect and where they will maintain that data then actually analyzing the data once you have the data right what do you do with the data and doing analysis and we have uh, in the future slides, we have stuff on how you analyze, right? What statistical tools can you use to analyze data? Actually analyzing and reviewing that data. Based on whatever data you've re received, right? Actually using that data to improve, uh, improve your process, taking feedback from that data and doing whatever action comes out of that analysis. And the final is process understanding, right? Sometimes you may find out something in that data which requires you to update your process understanding. There may be some change which needs to be made in terms of how you think about your process, how you think about your CPV program, which, uh, which CPPs, CQAs do you actually monitor and uh, really collect data on, right? And one example which he gave was around the mixing time, right? Uh, he had actually seen one of your APQRs, right? And if you trend your mixing time data, you're able to actually maintain 10 minutes mixing time for the last one year. You've been able to maintain it. Basically, that means that that, that is a process which you have control on you have the ability to actually continuously maintain a 10 minute mixing time. So maybe then going forward, that is a metric which you may decide not to uh, monitor uh, as frequently, right? Maybe you just monitor at the end of the year. So you may change your CPV design to, to um, include monitoring some parameters and uh, exclude monitoring some parameters based on your confidence uh, on the process, okay? be very clear, I mean, the expectation still is to have this mixing time documented in the batch record, but you might not transfer this data in the validated Excel sheet, which is for CPV. So thank you for stepping in. So then focusing on the infrastructure for continuous data collection, right? So the first couple of pages, it's very textbook heavy. So just quickly go through them and then focus on the later charts where it's more easy to present. So as we have heard, it's about the state of control and how do I maintain the successful validation? How do I make sure that the product still remains this? And when we take one step back and say, okay, how do I get quality into this product? So there's always a three-step approach. First, you have to think of what you're doing. So quality actually starts in your mind. You're smart people. You, know, you understand the fundamental science principles behind formulation development. So you actually plan in your mind a lot of thinking, and it translates in what you do, so it translates in your hand. So it translates into processes and what you ask people to do, what you ask the operator to set. If you ask the operator to set the machine, the tablet compression machine at 10 kN, for instance. And then you actually have the product, and then you test on this product and make sure. So. Well, we now focus again. How do I remain in state? I need this plan. 
and then hopefully this plan focuses on the right parameters that we make sure that the process variability is in control. Every process does some variability. So when, when I get to work in Germany, it's actually, I take the bicycle, it's three Ks, and there's three red lights. Usually I get lucky and only one is red, two are green, but there might be days where two of them are red, if I'm not so lucky, three of them are red, and so it takes me anywhere in between seven to 10 minutes. This is the variability. However, if there's a nail on the road and I have a flat tire, it takes me much longer because I have to walk and then it takes me 25 minutes. So this is clearly out of control then if there's a nail. The rest is sort of in control. That's what they usually calculate. If at work there's an inspection, the inspector arrives at 8.30. I know it usually takes me anywhere between seven and 10 minutes. I would leave at 8 to really make sure, okay, I'm there at 8.15, I'm in time to meet the inspector. Because this is truly important, I actually leave at quarter to 8, <laughs> so that it would even accommodate if I had some unusual thing like the nail, because this is so important. But other than that, this is the 7 to 10 minutes, that's sort of average variability, and I need the process and my planning to adjust for that. And then of course, what should be the, plan, the elements in this plan. There will be a much better slide later on, so if you allow, I will flip through this. Ah, sorry, it was too much. So, the first thing, I draft the initial plan. I choose the statistical methods. I think about how am I going to evaluate the data? What is my confidence band? What data should be trended and what's the scientific rationale behind? What should be the frequency of reporting? In stage two, I do have three PPQ batches. During the PPQ, we have extensive sampling. We learn a lot about the process. I have this great, great number of, of uh, data. And we can look at the data again and revise the plan and update it based on that learning. And then, of course, I re after PPQ, we revise the plan again to incorporate the PPQ learnings when we go into continuous process verification. And, as I was mentioning before, I should frequently revisit the plan. Is it still good for what I need to do? Sister, I need to jump in. Can I just, can I just uh, translate the last slide just to make sure. Mm -hmm. So, just quickly, right, the first thing we said is the purpose of doing CPV is to ensure that a process remains in a state of control, right? And when, it, when we say it remains in a state of control, what we try and make sure that it remains within the usual variability, right? So, the example which Casper gave, right, he actually bicycles to work in Germany. And uh, there are three lights which come on his path to his office. And based on whether he gets a red light or a green light, it may take him anywhere between 7 to 10 minutes to actually reach his workplace, right? So that's inbuilt variability. And as long as that happens, right, he can adjust for that. So for example, if he needs to reach work by 8.30, he will leave by 8, saying it will take some 7 to 10 minutes, which makes sure that he'll reach by 8.15 and he has enough time to settle in, right? However, if by any chance he gets a tire, puncture tire, right, there's a piece of nail on the road and his tire gets punctured. He will have to walk, right? That's an extra 25 minutes because he has to walk, right? So that is variability which is over and above what is provided for in the in his process of bicycling to work, right? Um, and that's something also which needs to be thought about. Overall, in terms of designing the CPD plan, right? The stage one, when you're creating, when you're designing your process, that is when you should actually think. So for new products, 
when you're actually designing the process for your product, that's when you should start thinking about creating your CPD plan. And what you determine, right? What is the data which I need to train? What data, what are the CPP and CQA parameters which I should actually train? What are the statistical methods I should use to actually analyze that data? And at what frequency should I be collecting and reporting this data? Then, uh, once you've initially created this design, you will actually go through your process qualification batches, right? You will have three batches which you will manufacture. At that time, you will collect much more data, right? Uh, when you initially made your CPV plan, at that time, you didn't have enough data. Once you do this, you get much more data, and in that case, you may want to revise your CPV plan. You may want to um, change which parameters you trend. You may want to change what is really your critical process parameter, right? So what you initially thought about the process will obviously change once you have three batches worth of data to actually look at. Correct. a state of control before it actually happens. So basically, if you're producing batches and then all of a sudden you know, okay, mixing time seems to be there. Hmm, there's a sh obviously there's a shift. So this allows you to be proactive and try, try to focus what, hap what happened here. You do not wait till mixing time will be here, out of range, and where you have a batch you cannot release. So that's the meaning of proactive. And then I will use it on the parking spot to revisit. Is it helpful for now? Are you happy with my answer? <laughs> so you're not entirely happy. <laughs> We're good to go, though. Okay. Uh, what's also important, um, we need to have the proper GMP framework. We need to have a policy or SOP that talks about the validation concept. This usually leads to a master validation plan. This then leads to PPQ. This also leads to CPV. And this also should talk about how those steps are interlinked. And it should also be linked to other fundamental quality processes like the gentleman here mentioned, okay, deviation, kappa, and change management. It should also give some indication on kind of changes and when you would visit PPQ, revisit PPQ, uh, what change you would just modify CPV. We all know there's minor changes, major changes, which <laughs> may have different impacts. So you should not forget about the quality documentation behind that. This is actually what this number of bullets, which we will see in a couple of slides later, but more elaborate, focus on. So what's the main purpose of CPV? Basically, it's 
how do we maintain product quality within control? How do we assure day to day that the patient gets the medicine he's, uh, he's supposed to be? So it's every patient's right to get the proper medicine. If you're a patient, um, you're suffering from an infection, you deserve the right to get the antibiotic at exactly the dose that's active against the germ. You would hate it if the dose was lower because then you would stay sick. So it's your right to get this proper medication. Investigators are there to assure that and it's our responsibility to work on that and how we're going to do that we use CPV. Um, so we need to evaluate process capability and make sure that process variability we see is fit for purpose. So when we produce tablets day to day, assay usually is let's say 99, 98, 100%. That's a perfect state of control. Would you agree? <laughs> so, and then also, how do we compensate if process variability is too far, goes off too much? Is it fit for what we need? What do we see? Do we see the variability is too high for what, what we need for the process? Do we have a lot of OOS results, which we did not expect. So that's, that's on how we compensate for this variability. Then the plan. What it should focus on. Roles and responsibility of the various functional groups. How is manufacturing linked to quality? Who does what? Who, uh, takes what data out of the batch record, transfers it into the Excel, how we make sure the data transfer is correct and that the data does not change during this transfer, what's the sampling and testing strategy, what kind of, uh, what's the normal samples, how, what in-process control samples we use, which in-process in control samples we use for CPV, um, particular in uh, PPQ, we have we sample much more than average than normally. So, what's what's the kind of uh, samples we use in PPQ? Should we maintain them? Can we reduce? Uh, how do we analyze the method? What are our acceptance criteria? Are they set? on the right expectations. So on one hand, we have the regulator clearly setting rules on how we need to set specs and acceptance criteria. On the other hand, we are free to set our own acceptance criteria. When I think in manufacturing, for manufacturing process, we are free to set our own manufacturing acceptance, manufacturing process acceptance criteria. Long word. <laughs> Uh, what's our strategy for handling out of trend and out of specification results? Particularly when focusing out of trend, that allows me to be proactive to avoid out of specs. Uh, what should be the timing for re evaluation the CPV test plan? And what are the mechanisms for determining what process changes and or trends require going back to stage one or stage two? This is also will be an interesting thing with legacy products. We will see that later on. Would you like to add on? So, maybe we use the mic. In fact, I have two questions. Number one. At the bottom. Yeah. At the bottom. This CPV is applicable for any new product or this running product also, number one. Number two, how to calculate the product robust robustness score? What is the uh, method to calculate? 
So a CPV is applicable for both, for new product and legacy products. The next section is actually focusing on what they do with legacy products. And then the other question on how robustness is dealt with, we have a later section which clearly elaborates on that. May Swati put it on the, on the parking board <laughs> just to make sure we, we cover it adequately. So for legacy product? So legacy product basically means your old product. CBD is applicable for that as well. The good thing with legacy products is that you have a long history of manufacturing. Maybe 10 years, 11 years worth of data. You can revisit this data and check whether the process is in control, whether it's capable. You can revisit how many OS results did I have? How many batches failed release testing? What process parameters was I applying? Did they lead to the right kind of results? So you should really leverage this data pool. Then you can determine whether the adequacy of set of parameters being used to monitor the performance of the process should be evaluated. So basically, whatever you collect, is it good with nowadays thinking to control the process? You might come to the conclusion, hmm, we never really focused on the impact of mixing time and its impact on the solution. And maybe the product has every now and then some dissolution failure. And that might be a case where you would like to use enhanced sampling. A typical thing in this case might be hmm, I check magnesium steroid surface, maybe I check the mean particle size and granulation, and I check the hardness of the tablets and the compression force. That would be enhanced sampling to generate more understanding. And uh, the amount of data, like the example with the mixing time, you might also conclusion to come to the conclusion, oh, this is perfectly fine. I do not need to dig in there and generate more data and statistical methods. So it can, again, it can go both ways. Very often we see with legacy products, oh, they're quite stable, they're in control, they're fine. Maybe some legacy products, which you do not produce so frequently, there might be more issues. That's what happens in my company. So the legacy products we produce a lot. They're normally fine. There are some products we do not have a ton of experience. And that's usually where we need to focus a bit more. So this process flow actually is great on how the CPV plan determines the legacy the way forward with legacy product. So we do a comprehensive review of the process control strategy, the historical production data and the trends, and then what events did we have, deviations, complaints, out of spec. Then we answer the question whether the legacy product is well controlled. Uh, if yes, we continue with that. If no, we use the process knowledge, do a risk assessment, and the historical data to identify the sources of product variability. We might need more samples, or more frequent samples, or different sampling. Then, can the process variability be reduced via minor process changes? Yes, we can implement those changes. If it's requires more work or more fundamental changes, then uh, we need to go back to stage one, redesign the process and maybe even run PPQ again. And then of course we update the CPV plan.
So that's the pragmatic way forward with legacy products. Thank you. Uh, what is the expectation in terms of you know, the risk assessment and CPV plan for products which fall into the BCA so class 1 or class 3 category, where um, you know, they're essentially from an absorption and permeability perspective and dissolution and absorption perspective, um, where there's no impact, you know, the inherent uh, nature of the molecule is such that no matter what you do, it's going to be absorbed and it's going to be bioequivalent. So this is a great rational where you can say, okay, we see variability on this parameter and with this rational, we feel like this specs and variability is fine. And then, by the way, the historical data will tell, oh, this variability is perfectly in control. So if you have a, you know, a bunch of legacy products, mm -hmm. then obviously you have to do this for all the products, but you look at the higher risk, which is doesn't fall into those categories, and then start with that, probably? Yes, you would look at what products do have more inherent risk, on one hand, and on the other hand, you would also look at the historical data and say, which data have high degree of variability, which data show that processes are not in control, and then you merge this to an adequate CPV. Does this make sense for you? So, key consideration, use, really use the historical data, assess the existing process variability, and then the adequacy of the set of parameters being used to monitor the process performance. with my notes, I'm also up to date. I mean, things you also look at is raw materials quality. That might be more interesting for legacy products because it might be a granulation using gelatin, which was more frequently used in the past than nowadays. It might even be a solvent coating, which is very different from an aqueous coating you're using, more likely to use nowadays. Uh, maybe there were equipment changes. Maybe when your legacy product was developed 20 years ago, it was used, there was a different coater. Uh, maybe you replaced that coater to a new one, and they might have a shift or a change in the process performance. And of course, there's, there's also data which will tell you about the personal impact. Um, yeah. This was just about potential sources of variability, right? Which are not only related to your critical process parameters or critical quality attributes, right? Other things which can result in variability in your process, some of them are uh, raw material quality, right? Um, uh, it may be the same supplier who's changed how he manufactures that raw material or that you have changed your supplier and there may be that in itself may result in variability. The second is uh, equipment, right? There's a product which you have, which, which you've been manufacturing for the last 20 years and now you've recently changed what machine you use. You've changed your coating machine, you've changed your compression machine, uh, one of them, right? That in itself may result in some amount of variability. And the last is uh, even person personnel, right? Employees. If you change, if a person has been working on that same product, on that same process for the last 10 years and you suddenly change that person, there may be cert certain variability which may arise in the product based on the person who's actually doing it, based on his actions, uh, based on how obviously he follows the SOP, right? But uh, there may be certain variability which may come in because of that also. Thank you. So again, it's about data to be monitored to determine the process and its relation to quality attributes. 
particularly with legacy product, how well is this understood? What process parameters have which impact on the critical to quality attributes? Are the critical to quality attributes actually defined for the legacy product? So you use your prior knowledge, empirical models, understanding based on manufacturing experience. So there it's interesting if you're talking to guys who have been in manufacturing forever or QC guys which have been there quite a long time or they will, they will tell you, oh, this, this method or this product, it's always been a bit difficult. So we, we really need to watch the hardness to achieve a good disintegration time. So this is uh, an example of uh, manufacturing experience which you can use the, the parameters to be monitored. And of course, you, you gain new knowledge, you might reduce specific risks and you might identify new risks. Like you said, oh, hmm, I don't have to worry about absorption or actually, hmm, this product is more critical, I have to worry about absorption. So I should worry more about disintegration and dissolution. I should worry more about API particle size. Was this adequately controlled? And then maybe you decide that you include this in the CPV plan. And then maybe you, you observe API particle size for say a period of one year and then you might come to the conclusion, oh this is perfectly uncontrolled. In the other case you might find out, hmm, actually variability is quite high. So the sampling plan you can use enhanced sampling, similar to what you do in a PPQ plan. Of course, you can include online and offline analysis. You can use the typical in-process controls or the, the compression force parameters which the press delivers to you. There's a typical inline example. Or you can use QC data which is clearly offline. Then the PPQ sampling plan is a logical foundation for the CPV sampling plan. <coughs> Actually, we have to think about the control strategy. So during stage one, you sort of draft your product control strategy. In PPQ, you update it, goes both ways, and again for CPV, you, you change your, or you, you update your control strategy. So continuous process verification has a lot to do with your control, product control strategy. I think we, we talked a lot about historical data. Uh, an interesting point is here, very often you would analyze data for information only, right? Typically in PPQ you would assess a lot of parameters, you would actually qualify them for information only because they're not important for release. And you should also address this bullet, what do I do with this for information data only? Will they stay? How do I assess them? Will they transfer in the mandatory? Can I skip those? What's the rational if I reduce the frequency on that? So. Sorry, I'll just cover this one. So there may be certain cases, right, uh, depending on the data generated, you may collect samples and you may be generating the data for information only. Right? Because you feel that it's not critical, uh, uh, it will not impact 
the quality of a product as much. Uh, data which is collected for information only. Uh, you may want to take a decision on reducing how often you collect that data, how often you trend that data, how often you analyze that data, right? Uh, given that it does, you feel or you've established that it, it does not impact the variability of your product and does not imp does not significantly or statistically impact the quality of the product which you release to the market. So that's also some decision that you have to take uh, going forward as you collect it. Okay, so we take a break now. Yes, the, the good news is that we covered the most theoretical stuff and concepts now. <laughs> the good news is also there's going to be a break. Uh, Maybe the bad news is after the break we're in the other room and uh, there will be you will be involved and asked to do some work, some discussions. I hope it's also good news because learning is ingrained when you do things. So the <laughs> okay, great. So we break for tea now. Once we come back. It's not ready yet. We just do the breakout and then. Uh, then let's just shift there and do the breakout. Mm -hmm. We can do that. Yeah. Okay. Groups of five. Each group will be given a template for the overall process flow. And the team should then fill out the template. Uh, swap this. Yeah, just, um, Checking in your documentation. Okay. So if you turn to page 27. turn to page 27 of your workbooks. Thank you. Right. Basically, what you need to do is on page 28, page 28, there's a format given for CPV process for legacy products. And page 29 has the various steps which are actually involved in a CPV process, page 29. What you need to do is that if you are creating a plan for CPV for legacy products, for new products, sorry, if you were creating a plan for CPV for new products, what was the, what is the order that you will follow, right, in your plan to actually design CPV. So, if you can arrange these steps, these 11 steps in creating a CPV plan for new products, uh, can I just borrow that? Oh, sorry. In this flowchart, right, based on all that you've heard, right, how do you think about a CPV plan? So, what you need to do is arrange these 11 steps in this flowchart. What is the first thing you'll do and what's, what's the order of activities that you will follow to create the design for a CPV plan? So, and for this, it's best to transfer to the other room. Yeah. Where just I think it's okay. Let's go. Okay. It's okay. Like, okay. Just for I think it's fine. Right. Okay, we can discuss in your room, right? You can discuss with the person sitting next to you. Discuss. But, uh, yes, if you have any questions, Thank you. 
वन रेफर्स टू प्रोसेस डिजाइन और डेवलपमेंट स्टेज टू रेफर्स टू मीटिंग टू एंड स्टेज थ्री रेफर्स टू Okay, is anybody ready with their answer? Yes. So, what is the first step? Which is what stage nine is what? Sorry, pro process development, right? So, process development, which is documenting your process, understanding your CQAs, your CPPs, CMAs, right? Process development is the first part of any CPP plan. What's next? Stage two. What is stage two? <laughs> PP. You process qualification. Does everybody here understand process qualification? Process qualification. What is process qualification? How many batches do you take in process qualification? The magic number. <laughs> magic number. Yes. What is ste step number three? <laughs> Which is? You select which CQAs and CPPs do you want to monitor? For what will you collect data? Right? Selection of CQAs, CPPs, and scale up report and PPQ experience. What's next? Collect the data for optimal number of samples. What's next? You have to statistically evaluate the data that you have collected. Okay. What next? Are your critical attributes compliant and within the control limit? Right. You have to check. You have collected your data. You have analyzed your data. You have to check. Is it within the limits? Everybody is clear on this? Obviously, if it meets, you release the batch. If not, then what? Investigation. You investigate to find the root cause. Investigate, find the kappa, and release. Basically, release or do not release. Right? You decide your batch disposition based on investigation. What next? Is there a requirement to change your process design? Maybe your investigation shows it's not enough to reject the batch or whatever, release the batch. You need to actually check for your. process design is there a change required in my process design next stage is process so they've clearly understood the process casper yes. if you want to add anything maybe it's also a good moment to recap what's process design and what's ppq say so in process design you have to you get this formulation and then you think about how should i produce it and maybe your first intention is to have a direct compaction mixture for a tablet 
and then you think, okay, the most, simplest, most simple and straightforward way is to add all excipients, the API and the lubricant into one vessel and blend it and then put it on the tablet press and then move the tablets to coating. So that would be your first thought of process design and then you would think of, okay, what's the, what's the product parameters I should monitor and what should I do? Then you would come to the conclusion and say, okay, I might find it very interesting. Uh, I must monitor the mixing time, of course. Um, I might screen all the excipients, put it through a screen before I put them in. So I will uh, check what kind of screen I should use. Um, you might find it very interesting for to evaluate to check content uniformity of the of the blend before you put it on the press to see whether the mixing time was adequate. And then you think maybe okay I should do compression force hardness profile and I should check dissolution and dif uh, disintegration at at the hardness ranges. So this is process design and as you design the process you learn about it and then you come to the final process. And you might find out, oh it's perfectly fine, I can move forward with this very simple process, put everything into one bin, blend it for 10 minutes and then put it on the press. And then you successfully validate it. So you in validation, again, you think of what's the critical process parameters I would like and the samples I would like to cover in PPQ, which is then from a PPQ strategy you might decide, okay, my process range for blending is target is 10 minutes. I know from development it works at 8 and it works at 12 minutes and then you decide to validate from 9 to 11 minutes. So maybe one of the batches you blend for 9 minutes, one of them you blend for 10 minutes and one you blend for 11 minutes. And then you do the full loaded sampling which is a lot of non-routine samples. You would come to the conclusion and decide that you would like to do blend uniformity after 9 minutes, 10 minutes and 11 minutes. You would then uh, do compression force hardness dissolution profiles. You would of course do the routine samples which is a uh, tablet diameter, tablet height, uh, disintegration. And then you would do coating. In coating you would do LOD to start with and you would do LOD at the end. You would uh, monitor standard appearance during coating, the standard in-process control and then you would run PPQ and you would transfer some of these parameters into the CPV plan and that's how you would divide those steps. So does everybody have a grasp on what's process design and how it's different from process validation or PPQ? Silence means consent. Everybody happy? <laughs> Does everyone understand the three stages? If there's something we should ask. Or oh, feel free to ask when you have questions uh, after break, during the break. I'm very happy to revisit these points. Non-routine samples, and you might 
if it's if radiation you're going to land, you might also check mean particle size at the beginning of the process and at the end to check whether operation happens. Do I change the fundamental properties of my granules? And on the go, you might even, as a non-routine sample, you might want to check those kind of parameters as well, flow analysis and distribution, topic size distribution. In granulation, let's assume we have a granulation process where we add water into a high shear mixer and we granulate up to a certain power uptake. Two key parameters to cover in this process will be the power uptake, of course, clear expectation, and the amount of water added. We're getting there, I promise. <laughs> uh, of course, you would then also monitor the batch record the meeting time. Uh, you would do the tag and bulk density, standard IPC control, which is expected on a dried gravel. You would do loss on drying. In particular, granulation is a wet process, you need to dry it. You want to make sure that at the end, your gravel is adequately dried. And of course, would do a yield. Non routine samples, examples would be you would do a flow analysis where you would check the flow of your gravel. You would do a more elaborate particle size distribution, either, for instance, by laser diffraction or by screen analysis. In steel run, when we're focusing on microbiology, a good, good example would be uh, the standard environmental monitoring, where you say, if you had an aseptic filling process, you would have aseptic plates, you would have contact plates, and you would sample your process. Well, in this case, non-routine is the kind of things you would do in the media fill, where you would try to cover your interactions. Say if you had a change in needle fill, you would cover this process in the media fill. And of course, if you had this as an incident, call it the incident, in this batch, you would then also cover this as a non-routine sample. Were they good examples to make you sort of understand the difference between routine samples, which is sort of the standard QC expectations? So this is, in this column, you'll find the standard batch document requirements or expectations at the standard QC, standard IPC. And here, this is whatever you need to learn and understand and control the process better. Then there was a question on raw materials and how you control the variability on that. And I was thinking along the line, maybe lactose is a good example. It's very difficult to get lactose without spores. In solid manufacturing, uh, you allow spores up to 50 colony forming units. And uh, Every now and then you might get a batch of lactose which has some spores in it, so bacillus, for instance. And then how do you compensate for variability? If you know spores has in the past frequently led to out of spec results, the way to, to control this material variability is either you can ask the manufacturer to get lactose free batches. Maybe you succeed, maybe not. Probably not, because it's inherent in the processing of lactose. Uh, then you would think of another way how to control it and say, okay, I get the material certificate from my supplier. And they analyze for spores. Whenever I get a spore result, I then decide to specifically monitor the batch, the end result for spores, to see whether it stays within those 50 column forming units. There will be a way on how to react to the critical material attributes. If you are happy with that, we will then move on to statistical control. And I don't think this is in focus, is it? focus on step number three, data analysis, data review. So, again, 
textbook like a page that's more for your reference when you visit the train from chill afterwards. However, the CPV batches clearly state how you collect the data, how you assess it statistically, and the uh, dimensions control charts are commonly used to evaluate the process over time. So control charts is a really great tool. I'm just going to dig in on that and focus more on the pages to come. Uh, we're going to learn about what does mean in control and out of control, and then how we deal with process variability. So first of all, let me focus on some statistical tools. Who has heard of control charts? Anyone? Anyone familiar with control charts or run charts? Only one person in the room is familiar with control charts? Anybody else who is familiar with the concept of control charts? Okay, so basically it starts with the run chart. The run chart you will typically have a time axis and a parameter axis, like an easy example like yield. You would simply plot the data over time. And of course, you will see some variability. This is a round chart. Then, if you look at this round chart, you might think, hmm, interesting. What's happening here? This seems to be low. And the control chart that's the same chart with some statistical parameters. I'll revisit this. Um, process flow chart, like the one you did, you filled out as an exercise. Histograms. Who, who is not familiar with histograms? Everybody familiar with histograms? That's a bit it's a good, great way to display data. In the human being, if you see data in a table format, it's very difficult. If you see a graph, human beings are visual persons, so it's it's all about how to display data. Some quest, some forms are better to be displayed in scatter diagrams. So Pareto charts. So if you had to analyze quality incidents, you classify root causes. And then Pareto charts will be a good tool to show which root causes are more frequent and which one should I focus on. There's also regression, which comes out of the schedule diagram. Box plots. Who is not familiar with box plots? Box plots, anyone heard? Not the wrong one. Box plot, it's also referred to whiskers or whisker box plots. It has a box and whiskers. The box is typically the medium and it's the upper and the lower quartile. So 25, 50, and 75% of the data. And depending on the type of box plot you use, it sort of shows the process edges. And some data might be here or here. And Foxbox is a great tool to, to check whether there's outliers. Do I have the majority? How does this look like? Is the, is the median here or would it be here? If it's like this, it would say the data is sort of skewed. The bell curve is it's not a bell curve. So in this case, the curve will probably look like this. And there will be the outlier. In this case, it would look like something like this. So this is So I think right what you're saying is that number of number of statistical tools which we can use to uh, analyze our data, right? And this is a list of some of the tools which we can use. Control charts, right? That's something which we'll get into in more detail. But typically what a control chart looks like, right? Um, it's basically an X and Y axis, right? Two axis plotting of data. And typically you have time 
on this axis you will have the parameter which in this case for example is yield on this axis and you will actually plot what data points you are getting right it's sort of a run chart in this 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 in itself is called a run chart if you add limits if you add statistical data in terms of upper specification limit lower specification limit to this right it sort of becomes more like a control chart you all need x and y axis diagrams right plotting data across time this is basically a run chart you add statistical controls that becomes a control chart then you have flow charts the process flow diagram which you just made right for cpd what is the process flow to follow that is called a flow chart you have histograms <coughs> I think in statistics you all make histograms to show frequency, right? I think histograms are something everybody is familiar with. So histograms. Then you get scatter plots, Pareto charts, regression, and I think one important one which a lot of times you use is box plots. So box plots are box like this, right? A, a line shows the median value. In your series, what is the median value? There's a line which represents the median value, a line which represents the top and the bottom quartile and then outliers, right? Uh, this is also a chart which is often used for statistical analysis. Just to show where do my 25th to 75th percentile values lie and how does this sort of look, right? How is my median value? Is it is it sort of actually in the middle? Is it tending towards my bottom quartile, towards my top quartile? Are, do we have a lot of outliers in our uh, series? So they are typical uh, statistical tools which we use, the one which we will get into detail here and which is most commonly used in our in pharma statistics for us is control charts. <coughs> so there you see a control chart. Here we have a sample number which is time based axis and here we have parameter or result based axis and we have individual data points and then of course we have the upper control limit and the lower control limit and the upper specification limit and the lower specification limit. The difference between specifications and control limits is control limits is statistically calculated it's the voice of the process Specification limits, that's the voice of the customer. Those are set by the regulator. For instance, SA 95 or 105%. That's the regulator clearly telling you this is what you need to deliver. And then where the control limits are, that will your process data tell you. And hopefully the control limits, your process is much more narrow than your specification limits. So that whatever you do, you always stay within spec. And of course you can look at the control chart like a bell curve in this way. If you would sample all those data points into one chart here, you would then it would result in a bell curve. Or in other words, most of our manufacturing parameters and analytical results, they are normally distributed. And if you look at a lot of data, you will find they follow the nature of the bell curve. Is uh, everybody familiar with the bell curve? Would you like me to quickly focus on that? I think you switch here this right. Specification limit can be thought of as the voice of the customer, right? Or the voice of the regulatory body. It is what the regulatory body or your customer sets as the specification limit. So in this case, right, upper specification limit and lower specification limit, which you clearly call out. Then there's something called control limits. There's an upper control limit and a lower control limit. Should the control limits be within specification limits or outside specification limits? <laughs> Logically, right? Your control limits have to be within. The control limits are a voice of your process. Like the specification limits are the voice of the customer or the regulatory body. The control limits are the voice of the process. What is the uh, variability within the process? Right? Control limits are set based on variability within the process. And 
typically, right? Typically, control limits are plus minus three standard deviation of your mean. Provided obviously that your specification is more than plus minus three, control limits are typically set at plus minus three standard deviation of the mean of your parameter. What else do? Where else do you use plus minus three standard deviation to calculate water? If there is an out of trend, if you want to know whether something is out of trend or within trend, how do you determine if something is out of trend? Typically, if, if you have three values, if you have 30 values and you get a 31st value, if somebody asks you to do a calculation on whether this is within trend or out of trend, how do you calculate? But what is the value? Mean value. So if it is more than mean, is it out of trend? No. When is it out of trend? Out of trend. Correct. Is here. Is here or yes? Correct. So if it's beyond the control limits, right? Typically beyond plus or minus three standard deviation, that is when a value is said to be out of trend. Clear? So graphically what you would do, you would have this would be the third first value. And you would visually see, oh, that's something odd. It doesn't look right. So you would then calculate the mean. You would calculate the standard deviation. And then you would do the mean minus three standard deviation. And you would then come to the lower control limit. Oops. Same for the upper control limit. And then you could check whether this data point is outside the range or inside the range. This has a lot to do because our data follow normal distribution or the bell curve. In a perfect bell curve, the median is equal to the mean. The median means half of my data on this side and half of my data on this side of the bell curve. And of course the mean is uh, calculated by the number of data. All the data, all the results divided by the total number of data points. Then you calculate the standard deviation, and if you move one standard deviation from the center to the left and to the right, you basically cover in this range, you would have roughly 68% of your data. If you extend to plus minus two standard deviation, you would cover 95% of your data. So if it's a process and you're fine be, being within spec 95 of your times of your time, you would cover this. Say this is what you typically would do with uh, things that are not tragic, like me getting to work. Normally, if it's not an inspection date, I need to be there at day 30. I would leave a date. I would know it's anywhere between 7 and 15 minutes. I uh, have some time to settle in, and it will be happy for the meeting. If I know it's a truly, truly, truly important meeting, like an inspector waiting for me, of course, I would not be happy with 95% of the cases. I would probably not even be happy with 99.7% of the cases. I would really almost make it 100%, so 99.99. So I would accommodate for much more than six standard deviations. That's why I would leave a quarter to eight to allow me enough time to even walk <laughs> so that whatever happens, I'll get there. And normally in pharmaceuticals, we are sort of happy with plus minus three standard deviation or the range of six standard deviation, which covers 99.7% of all your data. So the chances that I'm outside, it's very, very minimal. As a control limit. Why we choose this? And so we're going to focus on the chance to come. Um, fundamentally, with this, we look at the group we talk of common cause variation and special cause variation. So if I look at the process of the data, there's some intrinsic variability. Um, the solution results, they're never exactly the same, are they? 
So if you take the solution results, and sometimes it might be 81 percent, next time it's 83, and then 79. So it ranges a bit. That's what we would say. It's due to the process itself, due to the variation of the method. It will be common cause variation. Now you would have a tablet which is, or you would have the dissolution medium. It's only half filled. So instead of 900 milliliters, you would have 400 milliliters of volume in there by accident. Then your dissolution result would be much higher. It would be way above 100 percent. It's more concentrated than what you expect. So this would then be a special cause variation. It's basically a data point which is not expected, which is way off. So everybody happy with the common cause and special cause variation? This is an important concept. Did everybody understand the difference between common cause and special cause variation? <coughs> common cause is inherent in the process, right? Even if you do the, if you, even if you follow your SOP step by step exactly accurately, your material is absolutely the same. Your equipment is absolutely the same. The person who's making is making it is the same, right? Everything remains the same, exactly the same. Even then, there is some inherent variation in the process itself, right? Whatever way that variation is, it is called common cause variation. Aap kuch bhi kar, right? If you, if you, if you are like, I, I don't know, that's not the right word to use, but maybe if you're almost God and you follow the exact same things day in and day out, there will still be some difference in the results which you get, right? That is common cause variation. Special cause variation is a variation which is caused not by the process itself, but by some external factor, right? For example, you've changed your raw material supplier, right? And the new raw material which you got, which you got is causing some variation. You've changed the equipment. You've changed the equipment make, right? Or anything else. Any variation which is not inherent in the process itself is called the special cause variation, some external factor. Maybe even a third example to make it even more clear. So, may I pick you as a volunteer? Just imagine you will be an author, you would visit this company, and they will tell you, okay, my essay result of the tablet, it's always this. Exactly, this is. This is 99%. Would you be happy with this kind of data? No, okay. It's not natural, would you say that? So it would be very suspicious. So you would rather make another, another cover? So we'd expect something like this. Then, then you would be happy. So this is common cause variation. That's something you expect. So just imagine now you'd have something like there. What what would be the auditor question on that data point? Hmm? Suspect what happened. Suspect yes. Here you would say okay. <laughs> With this batch, could you show me the deviations? What happened? Could you show me the yeah, the lab results, could you show, is there any OS out of trend? What did you do? Did you confirm it's a lab error? So here you would kind of focus. So for you this would be naturally, you would say, okay, this is not what I expect. This is special cause variation, please show me. Uh, or you would follow up and dig in. So this is another way of what's, what do you expect? Common cause variation? Hmm. When you get very suspicious, that's special cost variation. So now imagine you're a manager in production and you see this curve. So rejects are going down from somewhere 20 and a half to 15. So I just the this axis shows time and this axis is number of rejects. Okay? And this is what a graph looks like. <coughs> so as a manager, what would be your reaction to that as a manager of production? Aapke rejects come and manager of production. Mein. 
आपका क्या रिएक्शन होगा You'll be very happy with your stuff. You say, "Hey, good job, great, excellent. Reach is going down. Cool, right?" Sorry, did somebody say something? I hope everybody is happy when the rejects are coming down. Question. So, sometime late during the year. Yeah, go then. You would find oh, reach is going up. What would you think as a manager? Say, <laughs> why on earth did I remove the staff here? They seem to be become less focused and reach is going up. Right. You will not be happy. You would ask some people to to to, to, to check a on other task force. Okay. Some weeks and months later during the year, which one? Oh, damn, reach is still very high. You'll be completely fed up. Okay, guys, <laughs> what's happening when we need to react? So, maybe stop being Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> okay, let's do a top management style. Let's, right? Might be a possible way. Come. And then, we just go down and say, okay, okay, this plant needs a top management style. Now I got it, right? As it happens, some months later, the task force would come back with the results and say, hey, actually, you know, we looked at we looked at the problem, we found this great tool, control charts, and actually what we found is your process varies between 10 and 30. So this is just average creation. So basically, what you did here, 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 and here, is just, I call it Ghosts. We were trying to react to something that's natural, something that we can't change easily. Certainly not by management style. Basically, if you're not happy with this variation, you would react much differently with their pain. What does that mean to change the process if I'm not happy with this variation? So it's nothing that my staff did right or wrong, it's just the voice of the process I'm hearing. So you could have saved from the task force, you could have, and actually, in this way, control chart is a really great tool to help you as a manager or as a um, formulation scientist to focus on where should I to, to, to focus, so where should I put my attention. So it's completely useless if you react with it here, which is common cause variation, and you react in a way you would react to special cause variation or an outlier. However, if you do have an outlier, so the data point which is mentioned, we have data point here, you would then react very differently. Of course, the quality systems would kick in. Somebody would, somebody, somebody quality would ask you to do an investigation. Uh, you would write an investigation report. You might define cop on how to avoid this special cause variation in the future. Can I just uh, cover this chart once? So just to explain the right, difference between common cause and special cause variation. If, if, if you as uh, uh, pharma managers right, don't understand the difference uh, between common cause and special cause variation, what can happen right? if you don't understand control limits? So if, if in the first three months right, the chart looks like this, rejections are going down, you will be happy. Suppose you didn't know what your control limits are, right? You didn't know what your control limits are. As a manager, you will see in any plant, in any unit, way, the rejects are coming down. You say, very good, huh? very nice. It's all coming down. Then, in the next three months, you see an increase, right? You'll say, what the hell is going on, right? What are you guys doing wrong? Why are you not doing things properly? Why are you not keeping rejects low? Yes or no? Yes. Natural reaction, right? Very good. Bad rai, kyu bad rai? Sab aisa karte hai, right? Then, aap log mein data, sabko line mein lagaya, ye kya kya kar kya hai toh? Fir bhi badte gaye. Isse ab to acha banna chhodna hai. I will not be Mr. Nice Guy anymore. I have to take action against those who result in who do work which results in rejects. So you have to start becoming tougher. Then, when you start becoming tougher, you see rejects are coming down. 
इन लोगों के साथ सख्ती करो तभी सीखते Yes, you will lose. <laughs> it's okay. As far as one, bad luck. 
I would flip the set card again. Again, heads up and I would win. So you lose two times. <laughs> you know this. Three times, four. if I would flip the coin nine times, it would always be heads up. You would not trust me and would say, can I see that coin? <laughs> or can, can I flip the coin myself? <laughs> So basically, it's, it's not impossible statistically that I flip the coin nine times in a row and it's nine times heads up. But it's not what we would usually expect. So although everything is between the limit, the statistical charges of this variant will become extremely low. Of all the possible statistical results, it's becoming in the range of only 0.3% of the cases that will result in this case all the possibilities that we have. So again, you would say, hey, now I should focus. So this may indicate the shift this year. Yeah, to so I think what, uh, what Casper was saying, right? Imagine if you were playing a game of heads and tails with a coin, right? And you serve and you serve and right? And he said heads, and he flips. He flips, he flips, he flips, it always comes in. Nine points. He flips nine times. And nine times it comes as head. Would you suspect something? So you would say, no, no, if it is head, but if he is flipping and he is calling heads, he should definitely suspect something. So probably put up a coin with double heads. Right? So the idea is there was a mean which you had of the process, right? Now consistently you are performing below the mean, right? Maybe there's some change or shift which is happening in the process itself, right? And therefore there's something which you may want to look at, right? You may want to think about what's happening. Obviously nine data points is not the perfect, right? Typically in statistics we look at 30, at least 30 data points. It's just, it's just an example to show you, but if 30 data points, for example, consistently come below the mean, right? It's, a, it's, it's something which you should suspect and start looking at the process. Is my process shifting? I think even with the 9 data points, did you mention statistically it's only yes. points? So if we look at, at the balance curve, it's only statistically point zero three. So basically, I'm interested in things that are statistically very, very low. So. If I have a data point here, above three standard deviations, if I do 1,000 runs, I would expect, or if I did 1,000 1, runs, I would expect three of them to be outside. So I would expect three outliers. This is what I'm confident, so okay, three times I might investigate. And it's still statistically possible, I might find nothing, but it's still worthwhile looking at. And, uh, Again, if I have three times, uh, nine times result below mean, statistically, uh, if I do 1,000 runs, it only happens three times on three incidents. And then it means, okay, cash flow now is first by focusing. So this is a tool that helps you as a manager or as a data reviewer. What's happening here? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six points, it's constantly increasing. So if you wouldn't be worried if it's three times, you would be worried, but it's six times. Again, maybe it would be suspect something. Say if you had a wild filling line. And your fill volume, you would do often the inspection. The fill height would always be five. They would start to gradually increase. You would say, okay, maybe with my fill pump something is wrong. So it, again, it helps you as a, as a manager to, to, to find out is my process still in control or something. Here we have this automated up and down, up and down. So it's a bit like an AC which kicks in at 
25 centigrade, cools down the room to 15. It stops, then waits till 25. So you're constantly freezing and sweating. It's uncomfortable. It's automation might be uh, a sign that maybe the process steering is not right. Maybe I should focus here. So again, this is built within, right? within the control charts that sort of help you. When is it statistically worthwhile to suspect special cross variation? When should I kick in? And uh, here we have this rule summarized. So the important rule is nine data points on the same side of the central line. Um, six data points constantly increasing. You give this as a handout, so then it will generally be a handout. points alternation. So these are really the important rules. This is for all of the first layer, uh, two sets of specification models. So two sets of specification, we are explaining all the things from other two sets of specification. So the oh. this is only about the control limits. Kali 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 two sets of specification, that is both the lower side and the upper side. But my question is, suppose our uh, in limits are one-sided in limit, and our parameters are only one-sided. The lawyer, the limit. Only we have only one limit. Ah, okay. uh, only the average. Uh, basically, you're saying, okay. Suppose the uh, OSC limit is 95 to 105. Yeah, you're only one. 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 Only and you couldn't have, say, you can't have less than zero rejects, right? Then you only consider this one limit. So there might be cases where you say, I mean, yield is a bad example because yield with carryover it can actually be above 100%. <laughs> My question is, is there any procedure to evaluate one sided specification? Yeah. See, I think the question is he's saying is how would you use control charts if it's only one-sided specification? But I think control charts, what we are seeing is control limits, not specification limits. Even though, even though that UCL or LCL, USL or LSL, is for one, two, half, for two-sided specifications. My question is, suppose you have one-sided specification in there. So, Kasper, uh, uh, is is there a situation where you can have one-sided specification limit and still suppose you see a control chart that goes? Our impurity value is not more than one percent. So, if we look at batch number and at rejects, you can't have less than zero reach. But number of rejects, rejected wise, the inspection process, you might have ten. You might have zero, but you can't have less than zero rejected wires. Imagine you're inspecting a batch of wires, and some of them might have scratches, some of them might have particles. Those you would sort out and say those are wires which we don't. So the example he's giving is rejects versus batches, and you can't have less than zero rejects. So you have only you, your limit will be maybe less less than. X number of rejects, but you can't go less than zero. So you have only one side, right? You have only one perspective. You're just explaining that example. You can still calculate the mean. You can still calculate the standard deviation. Obviously, it does not make sense to add it makes sense to add three standard deviations. That would be your upper control limit. But it does not make sense to have control limit below zero. So in this case, we don't focus on this limit. <coughs> 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 
clear? So what he's saying is if in this case, right, you have rejected while versus batch numbers, your rejects can't go less than zero. You have all these rejects per, for the batches, so you can still compute the mean. Your upper control limit will be mean plus 3 sigma and lower control limit will be mean minus 3 sigma. Your upper control limit you can compute and it makes sense. But in this case since your lower control limit goes less than 0, you don't consider it. You only consider your upper control limit. Because your lower control limit doesn't make sense. It can't go less than 0. Right? Rejects can't go less than 0. Is it clear? Suppose hmm. that is 5%. Okay, so your upper specification limit is let's say 5%. That's not standard. Standard is 0 you are saying. That's not what I am saying 5 is. Okay. Not, not more than 5%. That is your specification. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's your specification, yeah. So, There are three things in a control chart, right? There is a mean, which is actual average There is a specification. And there is a control limit. What are you saying is 5%? Which of these values is 5%? Uh, level. Higher level. My question is very clear. Suppose I don't have two sets specification. Okay. I am having only one set. So this is, this is not relevant? Yes, not relevant. Correct. Only we have only one standard value. Huh. Okay. Then at that time, how will you calculate this? control charts. So there is nothing below zero. Yes. So how do you calculate Suppose the control Suppose my limit is not more than 5%. Mm -hmm. That is my limit. Mm -hmm. No, so Suresh, your question is I think wrong. Mm -hmm. No, no, that, like SA, no, no. no, I am telling that. There are two things. The SA is not less than 95. It's, it's not SA, it's not SA. Huh? What anything, is? anything. So you only have one sided control, control chart then. You only, ah, yes, sir, yes, sir. You only have one side. One side because the lower side is always zero. Okay. Sir, why I am asking this question is here we are not interpreted any control charts for the one side specification. So you can still calculate for standard deviations because you have a set of values. You can calculate mean and standard deviation and create a no, no, no. Exactly. Everybody, just one minute. Not as well. Not as well. Not as well. Not as well. Sir, 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 Compulsory one side specification and compulsory packet meter as number. Then the answer is custom. That's not the answer. Oh, you explain it in English. So, his concern is the root cause of the loop. My question is. It's fine, it's fine. So, the root cause is if there is any specification limit, any parameter which has only one specification limit. Something is not less than 85%. Not less than 95%. Right? So, first thing. This is a specification, right? Yeah, a specification. No, okay, that's 5% of the specification. Now, your data batch to batch, if this was degradation product, you can't have below zero degradation, right? Everybody agree on that? So you might find out, oh, it's 0.5, oh, it's 2%, it might be 4.9. You might find these values. So, you can still, from these values, you can calculate the mean. You can calculate the standard deviation. Yes, he means yes. He means yes. So, so, this, is, so this number is, so the limit is not more than 5%.
you have some data points you can calculate mean yes, you can sir. calculate standard deviation just one addition right so his question is when there's only one specification limit and when they're trying to compute statistical controls on mini tab apparently it doesn't allow so how can how can we use control charts when there is only one specification limit that's i mean that's the root cause of and he's finding it difficult is, to do calculations on mini tab when there's only one specification um yes um I mean, let's, let's leave the mini tab besides, but the fundamental mass behind it is you can calculate the mean, you can calculate the standard deviation, and you can add three standard deviations. Suppose that this is three standard deviations, and this would then be the upper control limit. So when you have a one-sided spec, anyway, you only need upper control limit. The lower control limit, there is none. And then this allows you to, to have a later process statistically with this limit only. It would not worry about the lower limit. Yes. However, just let me jump ahead now. If the computation would be, okay, my three standard deviations lead me down, my upper control limit is above my specifications. Statistically, does not match the customer expectation and specification. Also, when we also when we have a one-sided limit, lot not less than eighty-five percent, usually that is the lower. Let's say the no, lower limit, right? Not less than eighty-five. So eighty-five is the lower limit. Yes. Usually, I think there is a theoretical upper limit, which is hundred percent. You can never have a one not one theoretically, right? If you take any parameter that you are suggesting where you have a one-sided control, the other-sided control is usually a theoretical extreme, which you can't, for example, you, you can't have a minus one, right? You can't have a moisture content of minus one. So if one limit is given, the other side becomes a theoretical uh, limit, which you can't exceed. So you can't have a moisture content beyond 100%, or you can't have a moisture content <clears throat> below 0%. So the other limit usually is the theoretical maximum, which you can take as the upper limit or the lower limit based on the one-sided limit that you have. So even in this case, uh, you could calculate the lower control limit and the upper control limit. So in the example SASE count you the specification will be not less than 85% or at least 85%. So typically the solution after 30 minutes. So you can calculate the mean, you can ca calculate the lower control limit and the upper control limit. And uh, all you would worry is this, because it's not specified, so you do not consider. So you can look at one side of this So now we see this seems to group with degradation products, with rejects, but also with some of dissolution results. It's clear. Okay. <laughs> In Germany this is yes, this is no, and I can't. <laughs> Germans will be maybe. <laughs> so I apologize for this. Third channel back, let's have a solve of this. <laughs> so who has heard of process capability? Does anybody know what? Yeah. So there's a. So CPK. Yes. CPP. The others. Never heard. Of it. Yeah. So. Process capability is the variation in the process would exhibit if only common cause variation is present. So it's basically a metric we calculate check how how good is my process in terms of specifications.
process performance is how good, how is my process variation, and how does this variation fit to the specs. If you allow me to jump ahead one or two slides with practical examples, it become much more clear, I promise. So the difference between process performance is the long range, we would say, we could call this value PP and PPK. The short term compatibility we call CP, CPK. So from an importance perspective, CP, CPK, it's much more important. And with between CP and CPK, it's really, CPK is one of the most important values. We were wanting to jump yes. in. So process capability and process performance are the two metrics which we typically use to check for variations. Process capability, right, is the metric, is the variation which is caused only by common cause variation. Right? Process capability measures. Can you cite some examples? We'll cover examples later. This is a definitionally cover example. Actually, how to calculate what to see. So process capability measures only the common cause variation in the process. Process performance calculates the total variation. Common cause variation as well as special cause variation. Right? Clear anybody? Understand the difference between process capability and process performance? There are two metrics which are used to calculate process capability, CP and CPK. For process performance, we use PP and PPK. Clear? Process capability measures which variation? Common cause. And process performance measures? Full variation, total, which is common cause plus special cause.
where do they fit, where do they match together, and this is CP, PP, where do the actual data are, this is CPK, PPK, and uh, by calculating and looking at the following charts, you will start to understand. Okay, just to uh, tell you the difference between CP, we said for process capability there are two metrics, right? CP and CPK. And for process performance, PP and PPK. So when do we use CP and when do we use CPK? Right? And when do we use PP and PPK? So CP and PP are used in case of centered processes. What do you mean by centered process, right? When your mean lies exactly in the middle of your specification limits. Right? Specification limit is say 4 and minus 4 and 4 and your mean for just an example right is exactly 0. It lies exactly the same distance between your two specification limits. This is a centered process. When you have a centered process, you use CP and PP as the metrics to calculate your process capability and process performance. You may have a non-centered process. That means your mean does not lie exactly between your upper and lower specification limits. Do you see this? Yes. Your spec lower specification limit is minus 4, 4. But your mean is actually 1. It is more towards your upper specification limit. This means your process is not centered. It's not exactly in the center of your specification limits. In case of a non-centered process, the metrics which you use to calculate your process capability and process performance are CPK and PPK. Here, so if you were to if you wanted to understand whether your process is centered or not centered, how would you do it? What is the first value you would calculate? Mean. What would you calculate next? Standard deviation, right? Suppose your LSL and if, if you have to plot your LSL, USL and your mean, right? And if it showed a graph like this, towards one side, right? What, the, what would that indicate? It's a non-centered process. In which case you would use CPK or PPK. You should try to keep a second. Yeah. Okay, just thinking whether I should check my hat to do that. Uh, page uh, 59 and then we'll go back. Sorry, love. So, and actually you're going to buy it all. You know, this is my garage. The garage is it's three meters wide. So basically you then know my car can only have a width of below 3 meters. So if you would buy a car which is exactly 3 meters wide, there's no use of buying it. You, you can hardly put it into the garage. If you, if you buy a hammer sheet which is 4 meters wide, you can't park it in your garage at all. So when buying the car, CP will be important. That's when you're not there at the garage, you're at the car dealer, and you know, okay, my car must be less than three meters wide. Now, you're at home, and you actually want to carve your car. Basically, then, you check, okay, how long are my parking skills? So, CPK would answer, how, how good am I at parking my car? Am I able to park it in the middle of the garage that I can leave on both sides of the car? Or am I a poor parker which puts it right at the wall? So the driver can't exit the car or he can only exit the car on the non-driver side? Or did I crash the car? Is it a good practical example? So parking skills, that's CPK. When buying a car, does the car fit into my garage? That's CP. Let's go back to the other thing.
I was good at talking. He would like to know. We would like to have a process that's pretty centered. Because a process that's pretty centered gives you some reasonable degree of assurance that you will not fail specifications. If the process is not centered, you're more likely to fail specifications and more likely to lose the match. So how to calculate? So CP and PP, we actually say, okay, reverse my specification range. So upper specification minus lower specifications divided through my control range, which is the six standard deviation or six to sigma. So the difference between CP and PP is the amount of data you use. Here for PP, you would use all the historical data for the last 10 years. That would be your long range data. Here for CP, you would calculate it for the last three months of the last month. Now, it's important for CP, PP, normally you should consider 30 data points. So, really, the lowest, lowest limit you can start with CP. PP calculations is 10. You should not go beyond 10 data points, but normally use at least 30. Not so, below 10. Not below 10. Never, never, ever. <laughs> I mean, the calculation will allow you to do it, but the interpretation, it's not, it's not as significant because you lack. Maybe wrong statistic. So, the CP range should cover the time range where you have 30 data points, and that's the total lifetime of your product, of your process. Then CPK, to check whether the process is well-centered, you check the mean minus the lower specification limits divided through half the control range. So basically, Calculation, 
the the basic rule is L should be at least. Is there a guideline from any regulatory body or anybody which says that L should be at least 10 or at least 10? Statistically, if you go more, the larger the number of batches, the CP will converge into CPK. Yes, exactly. That's, okay, that's, the, that's the statistical idea. So if you want to get an idea of CP, you have to take at least, if you take 10, then you will have a value which may have a lot of noise in it because there are few data points. As you go to 30, you will get a better no number. As If you go to 100, then your CP and CPK values will be converge. Will converge. I mean, a statistician will always tell you I need more data. Yes. <laughs> sir, sir, one one question, sir. After cover, as a part of annual quarter review, you have performed the process capabilities. Totally in annual, uh, total annual year, we have manufactured 30 batches. After completion of 30 batches, we are. Uh, Perform the process capability in that CP and CPK values are less than one. But our values are within the specified limit But our CP and CPK values are less than one. How to address that one? So, they've done an annual product quality review and they calculated from process capability and their uh, uh, CP is coming less than one, CP, CPK is coming less than one, but it's still within specifications. Yeah, statistically lucky. We are facing that problem. So what, what does that mean? How should they interpret their data and yes. what should they do? So, uh, first of all, you should go, did you consider 30 data points? Yes. yes. Within that year or the past years, one or the other. So then, I mean, the, the statistical question would be, would this data be, is it, are they normally distributed? Does it mean it had, is it normally distributed or is it not? Normally you should do this calculation only with this with normal distributed data. So maybe you share the exact example with me and then we can also check whether the source data is normally distributed and the conclusion is correct and you truly come to a value that is CPK is below 1. And if this is coming true, then you need to revisit the design of the process, this is what all about. That's why regulators want you to move into continuous process verification where you spot this example so you have not robust processes and want you to work on the, on the process robustness to limit the variation. Maybe you have to, to change the process to, to narrow the ranges, the manufacturing parameter ranges. So, there's certainly some work to do if it's below 
Historically, 50 batches or 100 batches, you can always justify that statistically I can't calculate it because I don't have the right power. But if I take this and add it to the previous 20 batches or 30 batches, it's still not. I mean, the the idea is to get an uh, actual representation of what is happening. But if we don't have enough number of samples. You can always use the trailing number to get a number and say, okay, you can represent saying this statistically is not showing what it is supposed to because it's not powered enough. But if I take more data, it is it is what is looking like as a, uh, supposed to be. Because annual product review is a continuous process. There is a timeline that we have defined of maybe January 1 to December 31st, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so, you know, if you don't make map matches and you want to get to the 30 number, you can you can justify it. Yes. So, this is a case example and uh, we will 
can we ask you to calculate the CP and CPK value? Uh, in order to make the calculation easy, we have the lower and uh, lower specification limit and the upper specification we have to express the number of standard deviations. But this is not in real life. In real life we would have say 95, 105 plus minus four standard deviations. So on page 56. Okay. 56, 56. And if anybody needs calculators, we have calculators also. Where's that? Give a very simple calculation. You won't need it for this exercise. If anybody needs calculators, please let us know. You all have your formula also in your book, so you can refer back to your formula. Formula is now on page 53. So if you want, you can look back at page 53 as a reference. If you want to look at the formula, you can look at page 53. You have it there. So. Here, if the answer here came as 2, 
effectively. What would that mean, right? Your upper specification limit would be six. Because one, one more, and then two. Clear? Does everybody understand that? What does this number signify? Does anybody want me to explain that again? What does this 1.33 mean? Right? This 1.33 signifies how your process fits into your specification limits. Right? In this case, how much further from the mean is my process 3? 3, right? So if 3 is 1, if you assume 3 to be 1, and I look at my upper specification limit, the space is actually 4. So it is 1.33 times within the specification limit. So it means that even though it is all running well and within the upper limit and the lower limit, there is you know some room for error. Yeah. But if there is if it is two, it means that our run is very tight and you know the specific <coughs> spec range is quite wide. Correct. And you know it's a it's a good process and a good spec range. So there is a little chance for error. So the room for error which you have is only 0 0.33. <laughs> 1 by 3. <laughs> and we, I think we will cover that car example again. I think that will, after doing these calculations, that will make it a little bit clearer. Yes. And then for a CPA calculation, I look at the minimum of the mean towards the lower specification limits and the mean towards the upper specification limit and divide it by half of the process control range. So since it's a standard process, mean towards the specification, it's four sig minus direction, and it's four sig minus direction, divided by three sigma, which also becomes <coughs> one point three three. So if CP and CPK are exactly the same number, the process is perfectly same. It's a perfect normal value. Okay, it's a check. The CP and the CPK value are the same here. Why? In a centered process. In a centered process, your CP and your CPK value will always be the same. No, let me ask, is it centered around the mean or zero? Right, because if it's centered around something else, it could be different. Correct. I mean, it's centered, centered between the specification and the Centering has to be around the specification. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it is in the, uh, around the mean then? Yes. Even if, even if the same bell curve and my limits shift by one sigma down, it will not be a centered. It will not be centered. And those values will not. You actually can't actually say the mean because the mean is centered on the specification. So the next example will kind of actually if my yeah. if my upper specification limits move one by one down by one, this one is also down by one. C P would stay the same, but C P K would come to one. We don't to see that in the next example. So, Okay, next page. So you can make another formula. So that's exactly the example what happened. So the bell curve would shift the So on page 58, can you again, we'll come to this page, so we'll see it again based on these calculations. Give us a little bit of time to write this, but if you will go to page 58 and calculate that. Don't worry if you've not noted it down, we'll give you the solutions yes. at the end of the day. <laughs>
correct so in this case if this is this is six sigma right from four to minus two this is six sigma yes or no yes 99.7 percent of my values will fall within this curve 0.15 percent will fall here 0.15 percent will fall here yes for the 0.15% which fall here, is there a problem? No. Because it will still remain within? For 0.15% which will fall here, is there a risk? Yes. What will happen to that value? It will go out of specification. And hence, therefore, when your CPK value comes 1, right, it means that there is no room left for error. Your process is, if, if, if you make any error beyond this, allowed for it will basically on this side it will basically go out of Where we clearly should react, dig into the data and the process and see what's, what's going to happen. You may accept values could be sort of 1 to 1.33. So, from a, from a color code, if it was a graphic light, if you look at the scene, Thank you. 
And obviously we see here there's a lot of room. So the curve is not well centered at all. Or the voice of the process does not fit the voice of the customer in a good way. Yeah. 
have two more batches. So, in this case, out of 100 batches, two to three will be out of stack. Uh, on this 5% of the upper limit. Two to three on the upper limit, and two to three on the lower limit. So, five out of 100 batches will be out of stack. And to do the final recap, we now revisit the car example. So when buying a car, we look at CP value, and we want to clear it to be above one, greater than one. So if it was CP, in this case 1.33, it means I do have some room here and some room here to open the doors in my garage. So I deal with buying a car 1.33 or above. When I buy a car with exactly CP1, I just put it in the garage and I have to get out the boot of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good solution, is it? <laughs> How will you get out of it just by taking it to the garage? <laughs> and if it's below one, I will, I will never ever be able to park the car in the garage or crash it. So then, parking skills. So if my CPK value is above one, it means I parked it well into the garage. So just to explain, right? Uh, usually centered, centered process, right? When you, when you gave that car example, right? It's usually centered when you're thinking about buying it, and you think you will always park in the center. You you assume you will always park in the center. So when you're buying a car, right? You your car, car is three, your garage is three meters. You will always buy greater than three meters, and hopefully at least one point three three and above, right? And you will assume you will always park in the center. But when you actually start parking, right? Which is when you actually start making your product, right? You may not always be centered. It's your skill, right? And whatever other variations which may happen. So CP is sort of centered. When you're thinking about buying the car, CPK is actually testing your parking skills, right? How are you actually doing on that process? In, are you being able to keep your process centered or? And when you actually park the car, there might be literally some noise when you have your kids in the back and they scream. They're hungry, they want to get home, and ah, daddy! <laughs> and uh, you're distracted, and your parking skills are not the same as if you're completely relaxed, and you park to the side. And if your parking skills result in a CPK of 1, as a driver, you will not be able to get out of the car. Uh, you CPK cannot have to leave your kids. <laughs> in this example, you actually crashed the car. I don't wish you this at all. But, uh, what I do wish you is for an appetitous lunch. Okay, thank you everybody. We'll break for lunch now. Uh, we'll, take a, we'll see you back at 1.45. One five, one forty-five. We'll see you back. All right. Thank you so much. So that's why I also said I consider CPK much more meaningful and important because this is the activity park we do every day. Buying a car we do once every couple of years. So as a next step, we would like. Yeah. So all of you all, please open. In case, which is just taking the concepts to the next level, more realistic number. So, what we want you to do is, assuming these are real numbers, we want you to compute all the parameters that we have just learned, right? So, a legacy veterinary OST product named product X is manufactured in 20 MG tablets. Around 50 batches manufactured per annum with limited or low yeast problems. Assuming the product that is robust, no risk analysis was performed, critical attributes were these three. Okay? Mean your within sigma is your sigma and this is your SD that we just learned, right? And then you have to compute these numbers. So we'll go along with this case as we do the further exercise, but to start off with, for assay, those are your numbers and we want you to calculate these uh, metrics. You also have calculators on your table, you can work in groups and then start trying to calculate these numbers.
Because in, in reality, if you're actually calculating for RC, you will have numbers like this, right? So how would you do it? <laughs>
chart is outside specification limits. That's exactly, in your case, this is what it means. And therefore, it's a non-centered process. And CP is greater than 1 because there's a lot of space on this side. CP is greater than 1. But CPK is less than 1 because on one side you are actually out of specification. What is the final term you will have? So if, if this was the chart, what should we do? Uh, so first of all, we should check how the specification of the <laughs> do, I, do I have room to change those? Are they just internal or are they are they filed? Do they are they derived from regulatory guidelines? What group do I have? If this is regulatory expectations like essay between 105 and 195 percent, you then is a ESP monograph we follow the specification that is mentioned in the Yes. That is the regulatory guideline. Yes. Regulatory specification is So then it's carpet stone. It's very difficult to. <laughs> <laughs> so then you should work with the process. Typically with the carpet plan. So. Here, you can't really change the specifications, right? You are using USB specifications. You can't change the specifications. You need to go back and look at your process and change your process. Improve your process. Improve your process. So, so what he was saying is, if the specification limits, it depends on what the specification limits are. If they are regulatory requirements, then they can't be changed. But in other cases, if you see something like this, and it's an internal limit that the QA has put, or the, or the R and D has put, or the production has put, then they can be reevaluated. Yes, they can be at least reevaluated. But if it's a regulatory requirement, where which is Maybe the example that you were talking about. The only option is to improve the process and reduce this or maybe center it if, yes. if that's a possible. Uh, what we also see here is the question is the process centered. Okay, given that the CP value is 2.2 and the CPK value is 1.8, is the process centered? If the process is centered, then CP is? Equal to CP. Equal to CPK. When the process is centered, CP is equal to CPK. I think I think we need to go back to the car page. I think uh, lunch has lunch has made people forget. So this is what the CP is telling me. The width of the car compares to the width of the garage. CP tells you, does the car fit into the garage? Yes or no? Should I buy a smaller car? Should I build a new garage? Or can I can I buy this house if I want to keep my car? <laughs> Those are questions you would use a CP value to solve. So, so you just go back, right? Okay. Yeah. So CP value is equal to one. Means your process is exactly yeah. within your specification limits. CP equal to one does not mean that it's a centered process. Everybody is clear? Because the, in a centered process, CP can also be greater than one. It can also be less than the, the, the numbers themselves signify where the process is within the specification limits. Does everybody remember now? Yes, yes or no? Yes. yes. So I'll ask you again. If if CP is equal to CPK, what does it mean? <laughs> does a center distribution mean that your CP is equal to 1? No. No, right? It depends. It depends on where your process is within the specification limits. Any doubts anyone? I don't know what is the guidance difference CP is it CP is equal to CPK is a process process is centered. 
What is the guideline yes. supporting that? He is asking that is there a guideline which says CP even the CPK be centered? No, typically we are looking at CPK values, which is one or one point three three or greater. No, sir. I am asking the CP the equal CPK. Which says that if CP is equal to CPK, it means your process is centered. That's What's the guideline supporting? Read any statistical textbook. Uh, whether there's a regulatory guidelines. No, sir. Within the pharma industry, following the ESP guidelines is the ASTM guidelines. In that ASTM guidelines, CP and CPK is greater than one. Process is center and state of control. The CP is greater than one, CPK is less than one. Process is not a center, but in a state of control. CP and CPK is less than one. Process is not center, and process also be not in a state of control. This is the ASTM guidelines preferred by the approved by the ASFDA. Sir. So. I would I would respond differently. I would say CP value is basically answers the question: Is the variation of the process fine for the specifications I need to fulfill? And the CPK will tell you how robust is my process. So I think we just note down what he said, and then we. So what did what you said that if if CP is CP uh, and CPK. Okay. Greater than one. Okay. Process is centered and state of control. Centered. State of control. Process is centered okay. and state of control. Okay. CP is greater than one. CP greater than one. CPK less than one. Okay. Process is not centered. Not centered. But process is under state of control. CP and CPK less than one. CP less than one. CPK less than one. Not center, not center. Yes, yes. Same thing. The second one is what? Okay. Which guidelines? Asian guidelines. Asian guidelines. Asian guidelines. Asian guidelines. I agree to all what you said and would add on and say in this case your process is not fit to meet customer requirements. It's not fit to continuously uh, fall within specifications. And that requires some, still some work. Although the process itself is fine, but it does not correspond to your specifications. So you're constantly deceiving the customer. You're every now and then you're out of specification. Every now and then you're producing a batch you can't sell, although your process is in state of control. So end of the day, it doesn't help you as a company, you're actually losing money. So you're saying it's in state of control, but it does not it's not fit for me to spend. Okay, so so what he's saying is it, it might be in a state of control, but it is not fit for meeting specifications of because the of the customer. So Okay, I, I tell you what, just discuss this offline, just for the sake of not confusing everybody else. Uh, uh, we'll take this in the next team paper. Uh, Casper can run and explain this. Does that work? Yeah. <coughs> and then again, CPK, it tells you how well the process falls within the specification limits. So going to the example again, we see here that CP is smaller than PP. So why is that? It has to do with the difference in standard deviation. So typically what we see when we have the overall standard deviation, we have more data. The estimation of the standard deviation is better typically when we have 100 data points, 200 data points, standard deviation is smaller compared to if I look at 30 data points. So this is a very typical example therefore. So now we're looking at a new topic which is uh, product 
and the adjustments. So now with this knowledge on uh, CP, CPK, PP, PPK, what do we do with it? So now we can analyze the data. How do we put that together? So we can analyze the essay data, we can analyze the solution data, we can analyze the potential formative degradation product data, we can analyze in OOT, OOS results. Um, what do we do with it? How do we put that together? What, how do we classify our products? Which product is more robust than another one? This is what we're going to address in this section. So the scorecard is a way to compare products. It's also kind of a side benchmark. So if you have different sites, where, how robust are the products on that side compared to products on another side? And you can also use that, gives you guidance on which products you should improve first. So if you have 10 legacy products, you can't work for all, of, all the 10 at once. You have to tackle them one by one. And this is a means to prioritize this. And of course, it ensures continuous improvement because you continuously analyze the product performance. So just to cover the page, right? Once you now got the data, you got the data. आपने collect किया data, आपने batch record निकाले, आपने trending किया data का, आपने समझा कि जब trend बनता है, how should I interpret those trends, right? What, how should I look at it? And there are some rules also to interpret. Then you did analysis. You calculated process capability <coughs> metrics. You calculated process performance metrics, right? Short term, long term. You understood all of that. What do you do now? This next step covers what do you do now once you have it, right? So the next step is to actually calculate a product robustness score. To understand each of my products, right? I, I may be manufacturing 100 products. When I have 100 products, ka CP, CPK, PP, PPK calculate kar liya. What should I do now, right? The idea is to actually assess, score each of these products based on these values to understand where I should concentrate. So what we calculate is a product robustness score, right? It's a scorecard to compare all products. Where does each product lie on a scale of risk, right? To understand which product is riskier, high risk, and which product is low risk. Second, it helps us based on this risk assessment, it helps us to prioritize products for improvement. Which product should I pick first for improvement? Which product is the most my attention? Ki need hai? Saw product can manufacture kar sakte, right? You can't run after 20 products. Does any plant have a capacity to run after improving design of 20 products at the same time? The important thing is to use this product robustness score to actually select which are the high risk products which need your attention now. And the last thing, right? This data analysis just makes sure that on a continuous basis you are improving whatever is necessary to ensure product robustness. Yeah. So just imagine you have a product with the solution problems and you have another product with uh, essay problems. How do you weigh this? One product might be more volume or more significant for the financial performance. And uh, how do you classify those differences from the process perspective? And this is going to be answered. Fundamentally, there's two steps. First of all, we have to think of the metric we are going to use, all the metrics that feed into the product robustness scorecard, and then which weight do we assign to what metric. And then we can classify the products and actually print them. So from a methodology perspective for risk classification, we can think about uh, three models. The first, mo the first model you would use all the risk calculated on historical data. Say if you were on a plant and they had 10 products that didn't did do anything with the not implement process verification yet, basically all you 
all you know is historical data, and then you can sort of rank those products. And also, on the other hand, the other, the, on the other extreme, you can you calculate the risk based on process capability metrics. And then, of course, you can mix. You can either use you can use some historical data metrics and some process capability metrics. So, so product robustness score. There are three models which we can typically use to calculate product robustness score. Okay. So one is what we used to do before statistics was formally introduced into pharma, right? That was model one. We will use historical data which includes uh, number of OS, number of ODs, number of uh, market complaints, right? Data like that. We use that data to understand how risky our product is. The second method is using a combination, sorry, using only process capability and process performance metrics means you use only CP, CPK, PP, PPK values to determine the risk on that product. And there's a model 3 where we use a combination of historical data like OS, OT, market complaints as well as this process capability and process performance metrics. You can use any of these three models to actually calculate your product risk score. <coughs> How you do that? So you use the model of the parameters. You assign weightages. So some factors might be more important than others. You might come to the conclusion, oh, complaints, it's not so important after all. However, OS results. So complaints are coming from the market. Maybe you're delivered to the Japanese market and you get a lot of complaints because of cosmetic defects which does not have the same weightage for you as an other specification where you have an essay failure. So that's how you assign those weightages. And then of course you sum up all the parameters to come to final risk score per product. So with method one, an example of things you would do, you would we do is assign 50% of the weight to the least challenges, which would be measured by confirmed OS over the last five years. Uh, five, sorry, five months. <laughs> and then you would say, okay, 50% I assign to this parameter listed here. So this will be the yield variation, which will be the percent of confirmed OS over the last one and a half years number of confirmed OS over the last, the percentage, you get the number of uh, OS over the last 18 months, the OS as a double influence, the number of quality events, and the number of OT. And here you would say, okay, an OS is more significant than a quality event which might be a variation, <coughs> or which might be a batch record comment. So that's why, how you differentiate the influence of each factor. Are we happy with this model one example? Did you want to jump in? Did everybody understand this? Hey, sorry, okay, once that anybody open that page and just read it. Just read this model once. It's page number 17. Just turn to page number 73 and just read that. Second, third, third, third. Second, third, third. Second, third, third. Second, third, third. Second,
Place. This, is a, this is only an example of things you can look at. So if you were going to implement such a model, you would have to come up with a suggestion, score all your products, and then critically ask yourself, does this make sense? How does this model discriminate my products? If I, have a, if I come up with a model where all my products are at very high score, and I have, don't have differentiation, the model does not fit for its purpose, then I have to rethink. So this is an example of uh, a model where you would use uh, historical data and uh, capability metrics. 
So you know the DPK, DPK that if we asset, it, it's a capability metric. Um, the apples are on historical data. As far as here, we also create a number of lab events. And that uh, model before, we did include lab events as a source of historical data. So it's out of all that you do, all the parameters of KPIs you can use on your site. You, you, must ex you must choose meaningful ones and then check how well do the set of KPIs are selected for the robustness model. Discriminate the products I'm dealing with on the site. Model on the basic process capability metrics. And especially here we have critical quality attributes. So, say loss of life, SA. For, for API, this might, be very, this might be the most critical quality attributes. For that, we have all the batches and we can calculate. <coughs> then we say, okay, which factor is how critical? So loss of line will be very critical, asset will be very critical, uh, maybe degradation products will be medium, and uh, maybe particle size distribution, as it's a readily bioavailable substance, it will be low. So that will be an example of the side we could assign a critical effect of one. So then the critical weightage will be 0 0.5. So why is this 0 0.5 here? All the blue pens are wrong somehow. <laughs> so if you have factors of 5, 3, 3, and 1, what will be this? Uh, Criticality weightage, you would say for this, it's 5 divided by 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1, which will make 12. For this one, it will be 1 And uh, if you do it this method, all the factors will add up to, to 1.0. So then, for the weighted product score, we say, okay, we assign 100 points to a PPK value of 2. And we multiply by the criticality weightage. So in this case, we come to 3.775. So why do we count to 37.5? And we say 2% corresponds to 100 points. 1.5% uh, oh, sorry, 1.5 corresponds to 100 divided by 2. And then we assign the limit discrimination at 60. Say, okay, if uh, the score is below 60, it's at risk. If it's above 60, we are happy with that product, which would say it's robust. So the higher the robust score, the better. Why did we assign 60? Or where should the limit be? Should it be 60? Should it be 55? Should it be 65? Should it be 50? Good question, right? <laughs> How would you answer that? So, Going back to the traffic light. Oh, gee, we're gonna love writing. <laughs> so, we said, okay, it's definitely red. So the limit should be somewhere between here so it's very clear it should not be the zone where we were at. 
it should not be within the green. It should be on the upper side. But here it's different shades of gray, if I may say so, whether it's a bit above or a bit below, it depends. It also, as a next step, you will then lot all the products. Say so here we have the product results to score. Here we discriminate the fortune. And then here we have a new commercial value, which factors in price, which factors in volume. And then we can discriminate and say high value products, good robustness, we are very happy with those. And of course the model should somehow discriminate. If, if all your products are down here, maybe it's better to have a lower limit. So that's that's how you come up with those sort of numbers. There's clear boundaries where you should not move, where this limit should be, but whether it should be at 40 or 60 exactly, um, I can't tell you without looking at your products whether it makes sense or not. But then of course you would focus on this product because those are the high value products with low robust score. We're sort of very happy with those products because they're good for our economic profit. And uh, we're happy with those. They're not as valuable, but they're robust. And here, we have to critically think whether it's worth the effort to move this product to here. The market folks would say, we tell you what it takes from the market perspective to take the product from here to here. That's beyond kind of a technical manufacturing <laughs> thing. This is 
the criticality score. Now you have to give a percentage. What percentage does it contribute? How do you calculate percentage? What is the sum? PPK is 
the criticality rating is 0.5. How does that translate to 37.5? <laughs> How did 1.5 and 0.5 or 50% translate to 37.5? The weightage is given 100 points for 2. 100 points for 2, that's very good. Yes. Correct, right? So 1.5 How many points does 1.5 score? 1.5 becomes 100 